when we're thinking about reports, there's a couple of different reasons that we write them or you could be asked to write them. And depending on why you're writing it will kind of help dictate um, the content of it. But usually you're writing them to clarify an idea or encourage a debate or sort of promote a point of view or provide people with information. So you've done a job and you're letting them know about it or you've done some research and you're letting people know about it. Often you'll do it as um, a formal way of keeping records of contractual obligations. So if you um, are supposed to do a project, then at the end you'll write a report about how the project went, what things happened, what things didn't to provide to your employer. And at Polytech you use it as well as a proof of study. So it's one of the ways that we assess that you're thinking about things, that you're understanding things. Obviously in this course where we're assessing can you write a technical report, but as you carry on you do it in most of your courses at some point. Um, particularly if you carry on into the degree program you end up writing a um, number of technical reports. Lots of different ways of, of reporting. Um, so you can write memos or letters or short reports, and we'll talk a bit more about uh, memos and letters later. Um, or you can write a, a long formal report. And that's the report that we're going to talk about uh, in class today for a couple of reasons. So it's the most complicated type of report you'll need. So if you can do that, then it's easier for you to sort of omit bits and write a less formal report um, than it is for you to magically know what bits to add. Um, it's a really good common starting point. Lots of workplaces, lots of, um, of the world use those um, reports and, and technical reports are really common in English speaking countries. If you want to work overseas, this is a skill that you'll really need. So we're focusing on those technical reports, but remember that other, there are other forms of reporting back as well. This is just kind of like the pinnacle, I guess. Okay, so you've got a handout um, that has a checklist um, for parts of a report. So for assignments at the Polytech, every time you hand in a technical report or any assessment, you need to include your student ID and a declaration saying that this is my own work and it's not plagiarised. Um, and those things aren't required at work. So you don't need to hand in your thing with your student ID on it. Um, so we'll go through in this lecture each parts of those reports and um, talk about what they mean. Um, and it's important to note here that some organisations have their own um, styles about reports or require certain parts but not other parts or like you to reference in a certain way. Um, and that's something that you'll have to find out when you um, go to work. If your boss asks you to write a technical report, um, then you'll probably, the first time you do it, uh, be given sort of a, an outline of what the company wants in a report. Or you can ask. Um, nobody's going to mind you asking what sections they want in the report for the first time. Um, but so we'll talk about what we expect here at Polytech, and we, we think that's a pretty good reflection of what you have to do um, in real life, but it might differ slightly in terms of style, but not in terms of writing good content. Okay, so here's the parts of a report. Uh, there's 15 of them. Some of them take a bit of work, and some of them are not too bad at all. Um, so we'll go through each of those and talk about their purpose and about how you format them correctly. So the declaration is on there. That probably won't be there in a normal work report. Your workplace may ask you to put a declaration on. They may have had problems in the past with employees uh, plagiarising work, and that's something that they're really big on. Um, but realistically, often your reports will just be um, outlining the processes that you have gone through and what happened in the project you were in, rather than you necessarily doing lots and lots of research. Obviously, it depends what job you're in. Uh, and it's very difficult to plagiarise when you're just describing a thing you did. So you probably won't have to use a declaration often um, outside of Polytech, but it's really important while you're here and if you carry on studying elsewhere. So cover page. You need to have um, a title, uh, and often that'll just be whatever title you've been given in class or whatever the name of the, the report is. Um, for this assessment, um, your, your individual report, you'll pick a topic. 
So your title needs to describe your topic. So when I read it, I, I want to know what your report's about. You also need to have your name and your role and your organisation. So in real life, you'll have your name uh, and then your job title and the organisation you're working for. Uh, here, you can have your name or your student ID number um, and your class and the fact that you're at a target age group. Okay, so you're welcome to put either your name or your student ID number. Some students prefer to just put their student ID numbers so it gets marked um, anonymously. Um, if you think that's good for you, then do that. Otherwise, name or name and student ID number uh, is fine. But it needs to be on there somewhere. It's a real pain when we're going through at the end trying to work out who handed something in and who hasn't got a mark next to their name to try and work out whose unnamed report um, I just marked. It, it's um, not fun for us and it makes it very difficult for us to give you your marks. So that's really important. You also need to have the name of the person commissioning the report. Um, so in the workplace that helps make it really clear about who the report's going to um, or who it is that this report um, was requested by. Um, here it helps us work out um, what lecturer is in charge of this report. Um, so you'll, you'll put your lecturers as the person commissioning the report. Uh, and you want to date your report as well. Okay? So spell months out, 12th of August, not using letters and things, just make it really clear. And you want to put the date that you um, published it or printed it, which in this case will usually be the day that it's due, I imagine, um, unless you're all way more organised than I was when I was doing reports. Um, Okay, so it doesn't have to take long, but make sure you've got all that information on it. I should, when I look at a cover page, be able to tell what the report's about, where it's coming from, who's asked the report, and the date that it was done. So those are the key bits of information. And then while you're studying, so here at Otago, or if you go elsewhere, you need to have a declaration on it. And this is the declaration. You can just copy and paste it uh, from this PowerPoint, or it's on other documents that we give you. Um, and then you need to sign it and put the date, okay? And that's a part of avoiding plagiarism. So you need to make sure that this declaration is true. If you sign that declaration and then we run it through Turnitin and we find out that you have in fact plagiarised a lot of things, there will be problems. But this is a part of holding you accountable and making sure your ideas are your own. Okay. So you need a table of contents, um, particularly if you're writing a big report and you have lots of stuff in it, then people who are reading it often don't have the time um, or the willpower to read the whole thing unless they really have to. Um, so it's good for them to be able to go to the relevant sections. Um, so table of contents. You can do one if you use the headings functions on Microsoft uh, Word. You can automatically generate a table of contents at the end of your report. Uh, if that's something you'd be interested in learning how to do, then the library will help teach you how to do that. Um, I'm writing a thesis at the moment, and it's quite a useful thing. So if you're writing a really big document, then Microsoft Word has stuff built into it to help you do that, so it's worth learning. Um, if it's not too bad, then you can probably just do it manually. So use decimal numbering. So each section is section 1, 2, 3, and then subsections in that are 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2, rather than going into sort of A's or I's and II and IV and things like that. So just straight decimal numbering. Um, show page numbers. So uh, the PowerPoint has gone slightly off the edge of the screen for no apparent reason. But there's a list of page numbers down here um, so that people know where to flick to. Uh, and use that white space between so that your page numbers are all aligned down one side so it's really easy to see. Okay. So again, Something that is very helpful, makes your report look very professional, helps people who are using it, so it enhances your communication, um, but doesn't necessarily have to take a really long time. Um, if you're writing a technical report and your audience won't necessarily know all of the terms that you're using in that report, then it's a really good idea to put in a glossary of terms. Okay. If you're just writing a report that's going to be used within your organisation, and you're using language that everybody there knows and understands, then maybe you don't need it. Um, you sort of have to use your discretion and your common sense. But often there'll be a couple of terms that's useful um, to put in a glossary. 
So it's just a way of explaining when I use this acronym or when I use this technical term, here's what I mean. So there's a summary. It's really important that uh, you write it last so that it actually accurately reflects what's in your report. Um, it can be called an executive summary or an abstract. So it comes near the start of your report, um, but you write it at the end so that you have it accurate. Um, so you want to use sort of the key words from your report, the key ideas, and basically it's for somebody who needs to understand your report but needs to understand it very quickly. So this is probably um, the most read part of any report. It's what your boss will read first. Um, yeah. So it comes near the start, but it write it at the end um, much, much easier. And then there's something called terms of reference um, or introduction sometimes. It's sort of a similar idea. So in your terms of reference, you want the aim of the report. And you'll usually give us some idea about um, the structure of your report as well. So what are you going to look at? Um, what limitations were there on your report? So it might be time or it might be that um, particular people that you needed to talk to wouldn't share information for the report. Um, or it might be that you needed to do more um, experimenting but the budget didn't allow it, whatever it is, it's important to sort of talk about why uh, the report was limited, if it was, maybe it wasn't, um, or what things you had to exclude from the report as well. So if you know that there's an issue that could be relevant to the subject but it's not included in your report because of time or because of money or because of expertise, just make a note of that um, in your terms of reference. Um, and then talk about deadlines and talk about how the report can be used going forward. So you want it to be um, a relatively, or you want it to be neutral. Um, it's just sort of here's the context that the report's sitting in so people understand um, why it's happening. And you can use it um, as a sign-off or to form a contract or to, to start their understanding. So here's uh, the situation that exists here's what we need the report to include and exclude, um, and then you can use that to form a contract going forward. Okay, so background. So the background section um, gives a little more detail about the situation leading up to the, the report and the context of the report. So sometimes this will be um, really easy. The background will be uh, the person who was hiring me wanted me to build a building for them because they like to make money and think this building will make them money. Um, sometimes it will be a more complex thing. So it could be that the, the organisation you've been working for has been experiencing problems with X, Y, Z, and this report is a way of trying to understand why those problems are occurring and how you can fix it. So you want to explain in the background why the report is being written. So it's not what the report is about, you kind of have done that in your summary and you'll do that in the report, it's why is it being written, what's, what's the impetus leading to it. Okay. And then there's a procedure or a methodology section, um, depending on, again, the style of the place you're, you're working. So basically, how is your information gathered? Um, it's really important that people know that. Again, often it'll be quite a quick and easy thing. So if your report is about um, how you led a project, then the procedure will just be a description of um, what you did or um, what sources you used to get information or how you came to get the information you had. Um, at, here at OP, the procedure involves uh, an APA referencing system. We'll talk more next week about um, APA referencing and how to do it correctly. Um, heaps of fun. Um, <laughs> but so we, we have here a specific referencing system. It might be different in other workplaces. But if you get really good at APA, then it's easy to change your referencing style as long as you've kind of got referencing as a whole under your belt. Um, and then, yeah, so we should think about that. So. Enough talking from me for a moment. So have a think about where you could find some information for your reports that you're going to be writing. So for your reports, you get to pick any uh, engineering topic. 
Um, so where could you get some information? Yep, library. Where else? Internet? Yep, so all of the internet or specific parts of the internet? Google. Google Scholar is a much better option than Google. So if you go to a website called Google Scholar instead of just plain old Google, then you can type things in just like you do with Google. But instead of finding random internet, it finds uh, journals and articles and books, um, which is not much extra work to go to Google Scholar instead of Google, but it makes your results uh, a heck of a lot better. So we'll talk about that more when we talk about referencing. But yeah, so internet's good, obviously tremendously helpful. You just need to be careful about how credible your sources are, right? Because there's definitely um, freedom for whoever wants to say anything to say it on the internet. So you need to have a way of discerning if what you're reading is a reliable source or not. So, um, but yeah, good. So in the library, there's journals, um, there's books, um, there's librarians who are really, really helpful. You could talk to other engineers, um, all sorts of things. So there's lots of places you can find information. Yep, so books, journals, videos, photographs, observation notes. So you could go for a walk. If your technical report is about you know, a thing in Dunedin, then go have a look at the thing and take some notes. That's legitimate. Um, professionals, knowledgeable people, interviews. Um, probably for this report, you're not going to go and interview a whole lot of people, but that may be something that's really helpful um, later in a professional capacity, particularly if you're trying to deal with um, how a whole lot of people are working together. You need to talk with them. Um, internet, but with caution, um, surveys. Cool. Okay, and then there's the findings, which is sort of the, the guts of your report or the, the stuff that you have actually found. So it's the largest part of the report and it's all the information um, that the other stuff has sort of been setting the context for and alluding to. Okay, so it's really important that you organise this section really well and you make the content very clear in this section. So because it's the biggest section, it's the easiest one to kind of get muddled in. So it's worth thinking about um, things chronologically, sometimes makes sense. So if you uh, are dealing with a problem, then dealing with it from start to finish might work really well. Or you can organise it spatially. So if you're writing a report about uh, a particular area or activities happening in a particular area, you can work around that site. Um, it could be a sort of a logical problem solution um, process you need to work through. Or you could organise it topically. So if there's uh, lots of different issues you're talking about, think about how you're going to organise those. So often the largest to the smallest is quite useful, so readers get the most important issue first. Um, but you just need to think really carefully about is this going to make sense, does this convey my point well. So you want to use clear and headings, number your headings and your subheadings, um, and that'll go in your table of contents. Uh, and it's really helpful as well, where possible, to use images and photos and graphs because Often it's easy to show information in that visual format um, and then refer to it in your report. Uh, in your assignment, you're going to be including um, images and at least one of them is going to be one of your hand-drawn technical drawings. Um, so that's an option for you as engineers as well, is to um, submit drawings as part of reports because you now have those skills. Yeah, so it's sort of the biggest chapter, the biggest section. So you need to think really carefully about how you organise it so it doesn't get confusing. Okay. Graphics can be really helpful. Um, they need to be labelled and referenced. Um, and again, we'll talk about how to do that when we talk about referencing. And you actually need to refer to them in the body of your text. So if it's kind of a helpful picture but mostly not that helpful and you're never really going to talk about it, it probably goes in the appendix rather than uh, in the body of your text. So you want stuff that's really crucial that you're going to talk about a lot and explain. Okay. So the writing style is quite important in the findings because, it's again, it's the bulk of your report. So you want to use um, the passive tense. So 
Um, instead of saying like Mary unlocked the door, the door was unlocked by Mary. It just makes it a more professional um, sort of framing. And try and avoid using like I, we, they, us. Um, so the writer or um, the organisation. Uh, and you don't want to make it like a, a colourful, flowery sort of piece of writing. You don't need to have sort of exciting metaphors or cliches or, or, or try and make it um, sound like a creative writing piece from high school. Right? So try and keep your reports quite um, formal, clear, um, and just use language that's appropriate to the industry. So you, you also don't want to use lots of um, emotive phrases, like you're trying to manipulate your reader to, to think something's a really big issue. Um, if it is, then your logic and reason will um, persuade them of that, and you don't need to use a whole bunch of metaphors or cliches. Okay. Then there's conclusions. Um, so your opinion based on the findings of the report. Um, so here was the context, uh, here was the findings, my opinion is X, Y, Z, um, that this is a problem, that this is not a problem, this will be a problem going forward. You want to keep it pretty concise. Um, you don't need to do uh, a lot of work to sort of re-explain what, what you've already said. People have read that, they're ready now to hear sort of your conclusions on it. Um, go sort of one conclusion per sentence. Um, so it does, you don't have to write heaps on them, just make them really clear uh, and number your conclusions or bullet point them if, if that works better. Okay. So here's an example. So there was a, a little bit of a conclusion uh, and then sort of five sub-conclusions about regional councils. So I conclude that this is the situation and X, Y, Z. So they're really important because they give your opinion. So the findings are usually fairly um, objective, and then the conclusion um, is your opinion on that. You still want to keep it, try and be as objective as possible, um, but it, it's your summary of, of what's going on. Okay. And usually conclusions and recommendations you can kind of do in the same section, but based on those conclusions, here's what I recommend going forward. So talk to X, Y, Z, or change the way we do this, or use... Um, this method of building rather than this method, whatever it is. Um, so again, make them concise, um, give people some actions to do, and start with it's recommended that, and then list your recommendations. Or based on these findings, it's recommended that, blah, 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 and then list them or number them. So make it really clear. Um, it's fine for it to be in a, a bullet point list. Okay, and those conclusions can include, uh, sorry, recommendations can include um, future research that needs to be done. So uh, it's recommended that you look into this that wasn't a part of this report because it's important. Um, and then acknowledgements. So we're sort of getting, we started off with small bits and then sort of there was the main bulk of the report and then now there's sort of the small finishing bits as well. So this is the stuff that shouldn't take you too long. Um, you may or may not need to put in acknowledgements. If you're just doing a formal report for work, you may not need to write any acknowledgements. If you're doing a, a big piece of research that's taking you some time, then it's probably good to acknowledge people who were particularly useful. Um, if you got funding from anywhere, you should acknowledge that. If you got um, particular support from organisations who gave you lots of information, acknowledge that. Um, if your partner cooked your dinner while you did your report and that was really good, then acknowledge that. Okay. Um, so they're personal, so you can use um, I or we. Um, it's just a, a politeness thing that sometimes is necessary, sometimes isn't. So you can use your discretion. Um, and then appendices. So appendices are a way of attaching extra information to the report. So if there's something that was helpful in, for you in understanding the report, but that wasn't sort of pertinent enough to make it into the main body of the report, then the appendices is the place you put it. So something, um, I don't know, so it, it could be that there's um, a piece of legislation that is sort of important, but you don't want to put a whole chunk of legislation in your report, put it in the appendices. 
could be that there's a series of images um, that were really helpful, um, but you didn't want to put 10 pictures in the middle of your report, put them in, the, in your appendix. And you can reference that throughout your report so that people know the information is there. We'll talk about how to do that. Um, and it's just a way of providing extra information without interrupting the flow of your report. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's, it's, not, it's, it's things that are helpful but not required in the body of the text. So you're going to refer to it and say, you can have more information about this in Appendix 5, um, but you're not going to put it in there. You're going to label it as well. So your appendices need to be really clearly labelled. Um, depending on the size of your report, the amount of research you have to do will usually dictate how big these are. But even for your uh, assessments, which aren't massive, there will be things that you read that are helpful to you but that don't make it into the body of your text that should probably be uh, in the appendix. Okay, so there's no limit to what can be placed in the appendix, but you want to make sure it's relevant uh, and it's referenced in your report so that it's not just like making your report look fatter or making it look like you've done more work by chucking lots of stuff in at the end because um, then it's just like random paper. Um, so it's not sort of a catch-all net for like everything vaguely related, but stuff that's helpful but would, wouldn't really add to the main body of your text um, is in there. Okay, so there's a, a useful book, um, is Weaver and Weaver, um, which was written in 1977, but explains appendices really well. So you can hunt that down if you want. Okay, and then there's a reference list. So at Otago Polytechnic, we use the APA referencing system, and we'll give you some more detailed information about that. Um, and you reference in text, so as you're writing your report, you have what's called a short citation, which for APA is just the author and the year, um, for a book with one author, well, there's a whole bunch of stuff, so I'll, I'll give you details about that. And then in your reference list, you have the full reference, so that anyone can see where your information has come from uh, and can then go and find it. It's 100% fine to be using other sources and we really encourage you to use other sources. Sometimes people feel nervous about putting in lots of references because it makes it uh, look like you just like got your information from lots of other people. Realistically, that's what a research report is. Okay? So often, unless the thing you're writing about is something you have direct experience of, then all your information is going to come from what other people have said, and then you're going to draw your own conclusions and your own recommendations based on it. Okay, so use lots of references, but think about them carefully. Make sure that they're good references and make sure that you reference them correctly. So it's absolutely fine to use other people's ideas. You just need to say that they were other people's ideas. So if you use other people's work and you don't reference it, then it is if you are trying to say this is my own thinking and my own work and that is plagiarism and that will result in unpleasant things happening. Okay. So in unpleasant things here in terms of our plagiarism policy, but in the workplace also, you want to be really clear about where your ideas are coming from and you don't want to try and pass off other people's work as your own, even accidentally. So being really good with your referencing will stop that happening. Um, and then you want to write um, the status of your report. So when you're working in industry, it's often that you... Um, have a report that can be released internally but not released to the public until a certain date um, because it, it could contain like sensitive business information and things. Um, so if, if your report's um, confidential or embargoed, um, usually your report will remain the property of your employers, um, so you can put that on there, um, or, and they're happy for it to be distributed or they want it to stay in one place, that's the information and the status. And you usually, particularly if it's a, a super confidential report or something, you'll usually uh, either watermark your report um, or put it on a footer on all the pages so that it's really clear. But a, a full description of that happens at the end. Okay. So that's the sections of the report, the parts of the report. And like I said, you may need some of them but not all of them, depending on your workplace and how 
formula report you're trying to write. Okay, But it's good to have a handle on all of those. It seems like a lot of bits. Most of them don't take very long. It takes you two minutes to write a sentence that says, this report remains the property of X, Y, Z, and is embargoed until this date. Um, but it, it helps make sure all the right information's in there. Okay, so some general layout guidelines. Um, page numbering is really important. It helps people navigate around your report. Um, there's no page number on the cover page, uh, but then the next page starts at page number two. Okay. Um, you use normal numbering, so decimal numbering, um, throughout all the report, including the appendices. So your appendices might be section eight. So appendix one is going to be 8.1. Appendix two is going to be 8.2, um, like that. Um, usually number on the bottom right um, for here, but again, other workplaces might want you to number your pages slightly differently. Um, and binding is really good. Um, so you can get things bound with the fabric binding in the plastic or the wire spirals. Um, we don't mind too much um, in this paper whether your report looks absolutely perfect. Um, but in the workplace, it's a really good way of making it look like you're a very uh, organised, professional, competent person if you hand in reports um, that look very tidy. Um, so if the cover page on them looks very good and they are bound very well, um, then it kind of adds to the aura that you know what you're doing. Um, and even when you're marking, when you pick up a report that looks really good, um, you sort of feel happier about it to start with. You want to make sure that the content is good to match the front. So if your report looks really good and then is total rubbish, then it reflects poorly on you because obviously the content matters more. Um, but just thinking about how it's presented and how your pages are laid out will make a difference in how people receive your report. Okay, so that's technical reports. 